At minus 36 degrees Celsius, exposed skin freezes in minutes. Your breath crystallizes before it even leaves your mouth. Bare metal burns like fire to the touch. Tonight, there is no tent, no sleeping bag, no modern insulation, just five simple tools, an uprooted spruce tree, and a long, dark Canadian winter night. This isn't a stunt. It's a real-world test of historical cold-weather survival, the same principles trappers, indigenous hunters, and frontier woodsmen relied on when one mistake meant death. By morning, we'll know if these methods still work, or if the cold always wins in the end. Western Canada is locked in a deep cold snap. The temperature is already below minus 24 and falling fast. Forecasts are predicting minus 30, maybe even colder. The goal tonight is simple. Stay hydrated, stay fed, and stay warm enough to survive. I've brought only five items, a belt knife, an ax, a metal pot, a ferro rod for sparks, and a small pouch of food. No sleeping system, no tarp, no backup gear. Everything else must come from the forest itself. In this kind of cold, fire isn't comfort, it's life support. The cold drains your calories relentlessly. Without heat, dehydration accelerates and your ability to make clear decisions completely collapses. So the first priority is ignition, because without fire, everything else fails. Using the ferro rod, I direct a shower of sparks into a small bundle of dry inner bark and fine twigs. Once a flame catches, it must be fed slowly, patiently. Rushing now and wasting fuel could cost you everything later. As soon as the fire is stable, snow goes into the metal pot to melt. Hydration comes before shelter. Cold kills much faster when you're dehydrated, dry on the inside as well as the out. Shelter selection is where people usually die. Tonight's shelter is unconventional. It's built around an uprooted spruce tree, specifically its massive root ball. That dense mass of soil and clay will absorb the radiant heat from the fire, then release it slowly throughout the long night. I use dead logs to form windbreaks and thick bark to block airflow. It's nothing fancy, nothing airtight. The goal isn't to be warm, but simply to create a space that is less hostile than the open forest. Cold air doesn't kill you, the wind does. The shelter's entrance is left wide, and a long fire will burn parallel to the opening. This is a classic setup used for centuries. It radiates heat inward while allowing the smoke to escape. The final silent killer is the ground itself. Heat loss into the frozen earth is relentless and it will drain the life out of you no matter how big your fire is, so insulation is not optional. The first layer is a thick bed of dead spruce boughs. They're dry, springy, and full of trapped air. On top of that goes a second layer of fresh green branches, which are softer and more moisture resistant. No insulation underneath means certain failure. It's the one thing you can't forget the final piece of the puzzle, because in the deep winter, the ground is always colder than the air, and to survive, you have to respect its power. Dinner is simple, and every part of it is deliberate. Hardtack biscuits, dried salted beef, and a steaming cup of spruce tea. It's not a meal you choose for pleasure, it's a meal you choose for survival. The protein and fat from the beef get to work almost immediately, fueling thermogenesis, stoking the body's internal furnace. The carbohydrates in the hardtack provide a quick burst of energy, essential for what's to come. And the salt isn't just for flavor, it's a critical defense preventing the dangerous loss of electrolytes that can cripple nerve and muscle function. Even the spruce tea has a purpose beyond warmth. It's loaded with vitamin C, a vital component for keeping the immune system functional when your body is under the immense stress of prolonged cold. These are foods chosen for their resilience. They don't freeze, they don't spoil, they don't fail you when everything else might. This isn't comfort food, it's survival fuel. As nightfall consumes the last of the light, the temperature plummets. It drops past minus 28 degrees Celsius and keeps going, settling at a brutal minus 32. Sleep isn't a long, restful journey. It's a series of tactical retreats. 
It comes in fragments, maybe 20 minutes at a time. Then a shiver forces you awake. You roll over, rewarming the side of your body that was exposed to the biting air, pressing it against the slightly warmer ground insulation near the root ball of a tree. It's not hot, but the difference is noticeable. It's life. At the center of this small world is the fire. It's more than a source of light and heat. It's the very heart of your survival. And it must be managed with absolute precision. Logs are fed into the flames gradually, one at a time, never all at once. If you feed it too much, you're just wasting precious fuel, burning through your lifeline before the night is over. But if you feed it too little, you allow hypothermia to creep in, a silent predator that drains your core temperature without you even realizing it. This is a constant, delicate balancing act. It has nothing to do with bravado and everything to do with respect for the cold. Dawn is the coldest hour. The thermometer confirms it, minus 36 degrees. The small pile of wood is nearly gone. A brief trip to scavenge more fuel is unavoidable, but it's the most dangerous moment of the night. Every movement must be careful, slow, and perfectly controlled. Rushing, overexerting, and starting to sweat now would be a fatal mistake. A single drop of sweat on your skin can freeze, wicking heat away from your body at an catastrophic rate. But the trip is successful. More wood is gathered and the fire is sustained. As the first light of sunrise spills over the horizon, you know the night has been won. Not comfortably, not easily, but successfully. And in that cold, quiet dawn, the real lesson becomes clear. This ordeal wasn't about toughness. It was never a test of how much suffering a person could endure. It was a test of understanding. Understanding heat, wind, calories, and terrain. It was about knowing precisely where to place the fire to maximize its warmth, knowing how crucial ground insulation is to prevent the earth from stealing your body heat. It was about fuel management and the specific geometry of a shelter that traps warmth and deflects the wind. These are timeless principles. Modern gear, the high-tech jackets and sleeping bags, they make survival easier, there's no doubt, but it's knowledge that makes survival possible in the first place. Because when the temperature drops far enough, technology eventually runs out of answers. Physics never does. And this night proved something fundamental. You don't survive the winter by fighting it head on. You survive by understanding its power, respecting its rules, and working with it.